Good morning. It's Wednesday the 23rd of June 2021 and it's time for Davy PhD's Mythbusters, episode 37. Many things are said about Scotland, independence, the Union, the European Union, etc. In these videos I bust the myths that many people believe and are commonly peddled by those opposed to our independence. This week we explore the possibility that Alba could be the party holding the balance of power for Scottish independence if they are willing to get really radical. But first, we need to do a post-mortem on their 2021 campaign. Now, as we all know, two exclusively independence parties contested the Holyrood election in May. One of those parties, the SNP, is 86 years old, were the current party of government and were contesting all the seats. The other, the ALBA party, though registered in February 2021, publicly launched just six weeks before polling day, but with some familiar and very formidable faces involved. And now that the election has passed, we all know the result. For the SNP, it went well, but not quite as well as we would have liked. For ALBA, it just didn't go well at all. So where did it all go wrong for ALBA? And perhaps more importantly, how could they do better? Now I just want to say before continuing, kind of like the MSPs have to say in Parliament, I have to declare an interest, which is that I'm an SNP activist and actually a branch convener, who has followed, voted for and revered both Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Salmond. And while I can still revere them both, in the current political landscape I can only follow one, and we all know which one that is. But I just want to say before continuing that Alex Salmond is, in my humble opinion, an absolute legend. No one has done more for independence than he has. He brought us closer than ever before. And if Independent Scotland has an honour system, then I believe Alex should be first in line to get one, accompanied by a medal the size of a dustbin lid. I may not be able to follow Alex Salmond anymore, but I can, and still do, revere him. Now the Alba party may seem like it just appeared, but the seeds were sown for its birth back in 1997. Back before devolution, when the SNP was a political irrelevance in the UK scheme of things, we could afford to be a laser focused and single issue party. But when devolution was brought in, and the SNP became the official opposition, we had to be more circumspect about what we said, as there was a chance we might just have to deliver it. And one of the prices of that success is that we had to develop more nuanced and broader policy positions, as we had to be seen as a viable alternative government, which we then actually became in 2007. <sighs> Next along was the 19th of September 2014, the day after the Scottish independence referendum. It was the day that most people have joined a political party ever in the history of the United Kingdom. And we are fortunate that those tens of thousands of people joined the SNP. Now, that explosive rise in SNP membership propelled a fringe party into being the third largest political party in the United Kingdom. And with a new and probably younger demographic came younger and more progressive ideas and ultimately policy direction. This change in demographics and policy within the party also meant that some members who had been with the SNP for a long, long time effectively became a minority within their own party. Many of this generation felt unhappy. Many of them felt that the party was leaving them and were involved in the woke SNP versus old guard SNP spat I have previously blogged about. The ALBA party was a perfect political home for many of these disaffected and now ex-SNP members. So what did ALBA do well? Well, it has to be said they mobilised quite an army and it's hard not to admire them for it. Certainly in my constituency, there were, they were at times more visible and more vocal in the SNP campaign. And they got some key figures from the SNP. Not just the elected members, but they scored some real talent from our NEC and our general membership. 
So how did it go so badly? Well, first is timing. Electoral strategies involve planning, logistics, messaging, candidates being vetted and selected, local teams being assembled, election materials being printed. All of this stuff takes effort, time and money. All of this is planned out well in advance of polling day and no sensible party is going to set aside their strategy just because a new party launches six weeks before polling day. Secondly, electioneering is more than mathematics. The last thing any of us need is any more regional breakdowns of how SNP second votes are wasted unless you live in the highlands or the borders. We've seen the maths again and again and again, so I'm willing to concede that mathematically, at least, it is correct. And I'm willing to admit that even my head was turned by the idea of a supermajority, albeit briefly. I say briefly because it had been tried before in 2016 with Rise. And interestingly, this was Alex Salmon's take on it back then. Now I'm not attacking Alex for changing his mind. He is absolutely entitled to do so. And I also have to say kudos to Alex for not deleting this tweet, because I took this screenshot just today. But consider this. Alex is one of the best political strategists of his generation. When he was presented with an option that could just as easily have mathematically delivered a supermajority back in 2016, I'm sure he considered it. I'm sure he fully understood the electoral mathematics at play. I'm sure he fully understood that if Rise could get every SNP list vote, there would be hardly any unionist MSPs left in Holyrood. So why did he not promote the idea back then? Why did he not put country before party back then? Could it have been because he understood, like I do, that electioneering is more than just mathematics? Could it have been because he was a loyal party member towing the party line? And with those answers in mind, is it right for ALBA followers to continually criticise loyal SNP members and voters for not buying into the same idea that Alex Salmon himself, who probably understood the system better than anyone alive, also rejected in 2016. Third is short memories. Many ALBA members were long time, even pre-devolution SNP members, back when we were a UK electoral irrelevance. They understood back then that electioneering is more than mathematics. It's an act of gentle persuasion. In some cases it takes years, even decades, to get reasonable, persuadable people to change their minds. It's taken me 12 years of persuasion just to get one of my relatives to vote SNP. Alex Salmond was the, grad was the architect of gradualist SNP, and it has taken us over 80 years to get this far to persuade enough people to follow us to keep us in government this long. I'm just not sure what any of these absolutely committed activists who experienced the slow rise of the SNP over decades thought they could achieve in a brand new party in just six weeks. Targeting and strategy, well, this went wrong in a few areas. 2.6 million people participated in the Scottish election. But ALBA's target audience was the 100,000 or so SNP members who are going to vote and promote both votes SNP. Now given that Alex wasn't seduced by a rise in 2016, is it really reasonable to continue blaming SNP members and supporters for not getting on board with ALBA in 2021? Again, Alex was quite entitled to change his mind, but he surely didn't expect us all to just accept what he said especially given his past experience of taking years and decades to persuade people. Because all the while this was going on, the remaining 2.5 million of the Scots electorate who did take part didn't have a message targeted at them. And finally, media. The TV media blackout was kind of unfair. I wouldn't go as far as to say that Alex and George Galloway should have been 
in the TV debates, though it would have been good to see, because we could have seen how unhinged Galloway really is, and we could have been reminded how effective Salmon can be. As anyone who saw the list book ballot paper will tell you, it looked more like a Chinese takeaway menu than a ballot paper. There were so many partisan candidates on it. So a TV debate with all of them involved would be chaos. So it's right that only the major players were the ones involved. Now, Alba and George Galloway made a fair comparison between the inclusion of Nigel Farage in the 2019 UK general election debates and this most recent exclusion. And I do believe this was unfair. But I believe that leading a party with no seats meant that Nigel Farage should not have got a spot on the 2019 debate. However, Alba were quite capable of getting things into the print media and have remained so since the election. Their biggest error was aligning themselves with the indie blogosphere. Now, I can understand the irony in a fellow blogger saying this. I'd love to have the access that those guys had, but for the party, it was a mistake. Because the indie blogosphere tends to be full of anti-SNP malcontents, most of whom don't even live in Scotland and who talk like and pretend they're like cyber mafia dons, when in fact they're nothing of the sort, and hardly anyone outside the indie bubble has a damned clue who they are. Now, this may have provided the Alba party with an agreeable and supportive media wing, but could only result in either Alba versus SNP debates online, which served no one well, or circular rhetoric, i.e. lots of fundamentalist indie campaigners all vocally agreeing with each other, but not spreading the message outside the bubble. The mainstream media treatment of the Alba party was unfair, but the bloggers were not the droid Alba were looking for. The Alba party, or a list-only indie party, was a great idea, but it was quickly and poorly executed and targeted at the wrong audience. And the space they sought to occupy was already occupied. So how could Alba improve their lot? I know this next statement will sound weird coming from an SNP activist, but bear with me. Scots politics is too left of centre just now. The SNP, the Scottish Greens and Scottish Labour all occupy left of centre ground. The Scottish Lib Dems don't occupy much ground at all. So if you are right wing in your political outlook, you've only got the Scottish Tories. Now you'd be forgiven for thinking that there's no audience for that and that Conservatives are all unionists. But you would be wrong. Look at these guys. The Scottish Yes Tories. Now at the moment they're kind of like the A-team from the 80s TV show. They just exist on Twitter rather than the LA Underground. But this isn't a parody account, folks. I know one of these guys, and he's a card-carrying Conservative Party member who supports independence for Scotland. He's not alone. There are a fair amount of them and they're deadly serious. Ruth Davidson is after these guys, or, or at least she was, as she wanted to kick them out of the Conservative Party. I believe that Alba's mission should be to track these guys down and sign them up, talk to them and get them on board so that they and Alba can position themselves as they actually are. An independence supporting party that is more Conservative in its outlook than the SNP. It might be that indie support has peaked as it is based on left-leaning voters. And I don't believe that Alba going after the votes of a left-of-centre progressive party like the SNP is going to help either of us. We clearly need an indie conservative option and Alba are ideally placed to be just that. Left-leaning indie voters may not get this thing over the line on their own. We need right-leaning indie votes too. But sadly, I think that means that Alex can't lead the party or stand for election. I just can't see right-leaning people voting for him or a party led by him. So, what say you, Alex and Alba? As this is a question and or criticism you've asked us in the SNP a lot. So I'm firing it right back at you. 
Are you now prepared to put country before party? Folks, thanks for watching. Please feel free to share this video with anyone you like. Davey PhD.